Well, I want to welcome you to a scrumptious evening, um, and you'll see what I mean at the end. So to start, does anybody know what the world population is today? How much? 7.9 billion, so it's the average, yes. Um, it's a hefty number, 7.9 billion, and that's fine. By the year 2050, it's estimated that we're going to reach 9.3 billion people. Uh, 2050, 30 years from now. Now think about, um, so 9.3 billion is not an issue, except that 9 billion is a tipping point at which the world simply can no longer feed itself. We cannot produce enough food using current practices to feed 9 billion people. This is what's called the 9 billion problem that we've been hearing a lot about in the news. Um, it's been, um, and that's using current practices. It's been estimated by the United Nations that in order to feed that many people with current practices, we need to increase our food production by 70%, 70. Now think about this. Whatever you do for a living, however many kids you have, frankly, imagine increasing that by 70% and how easy it is to do that. It's not. The world simply cannot increase food uh, production by 70% using current practices. So this issue, the 9 billion problem, has been known for a long time. People have been working on solutions. Um, and one of those solutions are insects. Insects both as uh, food for human consumption and um, as feed for livestock. Now, around the world, 80% of the countries in the world currently uh, accept insects as part of, as culturally accept insects as part of their diet. Um, about 2,000 species of insects are eaten globally. And that, so that's a good thing, except that at still today, 92% of all the insects that are consumed are harvested from the wild. And that is simply not sustainable. And in fact, it's actually very dangerous. Insects are integral to every ecosystem on land in the world. And if you pull out the insects, you can experience ecosystem collapse. And we've seen this happen in a number of occasions. Um, we've experienced this in the past in a different system. After World War II, 1950s, 100% of the fisheries of the world were robust and healthy. 50 years later, every single fishery in the world was exploited, overexploited, has collapsed, or is on the brink of extinction. And that is clearly something that's not sustainable. The fisheries industry knows this. And so they found an alternative, and that is fish farming. Whether it's on land or in the sea, um, it's an alternative to uh, continue over-exploiting, over-harvesting fisheries from the ocean. Now, this is a solution. It's not a perfect solution. There are problems with this. Um, problems that people are aware of, and they're working on it. Along these lines, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations put out this report in 2013 called Edible Insect Future Prospects for Food and Feed Security. This report made two arguments, pushed two points. One, insects are a good alternative source of protein, and two, that insects should be farmed and not harvested from the wild. This report fell on really receptive ears um, in the community. It was downloaded almost a million times in the first week alone. And this is a government report. Who downloads a government report? Um, just to illustrate this, I put into Google, Google Scholar the search term edible insects. Um, and these are all the peer-reviewed scientific papers that have been published um, since 1990. That's about 8,500 articles. 
scientific articles, about 80% of those have been uh, published since that report came out. So the academic community, the scientific community, sees this as a big deal. The um, industry sees this as even a bigger deal. Since that report came out, um, 350 companies worldwide are uh, growing insects either as food or as feed. Tenth of those, 35, are in the United States. Not a day goes by that major media outlets don't have some story about edible insects. Um, the market is growing extremely fast, around 30%. Uh, today, it's around a little over a billion dollars. In eight years, by 2030, it'll be eight billion dollars. Now, eight billion dollars, so that's a big growth, but eight billion dollars is a drop in the bucket when we're talking about the hundreds of billions of dollars of, uh, uh, in the protein market uh, globally. What that means, though, is that there's a lot of room for growth. There's a lot of catching up to do. There's a lot of room to get, get there. And it'll be really cool if the entrepreneurial energy that's in South by Southwest, or you guys in the audience, um, can take part of this and move it along faster. So what's the deal with insects? Why, why, is, why are people excited about insects as a source of protein for food and feed? There's two main reasons. One of those is um, nutrition, um, and the other is sustainability. So let's look at nutrition first. Let's compare an uh, insect to a cow. You can eat only 40% of a cow. The other 60% that you cannot digest, the things like bone, hide, hair, horns, hooves, teeth, things like that. You can eat 80% of an insect. You, sorry, you can digest 80% of an insect. Um, that's already double of a, of a cow. The 20% that you can't digest is uh, exoskeleton. It's fiber. It's good for you. Eat insects, throw away the Metamucil. Let's look at the protein content. I think it'll be better looking at that screen. But um, let's look at the protein uh, content, comparing insects to cattle to uh, salmon fish. So you can see that you can get a lot more protein. This is for a 200 calorie serving. So you can get a lot more protein from insects than you can, can from cattle or fish. It's actually 30% more. Insects contain a lot less fat. Than, um, do cat than do vertebrate livestock. Um, and uh, insects, ha um, they don't have as much omega-3 fatty acids. These are the healthy fatty acids. These are the fish oil supplements that um, people take. Um, they don't have as much as, as fish, but they have three orders of magnitude more healthy fatty acids than do cattle. And of course, insects have fiber. Um, which vertebrate livestock don't. That's assuming you're plucking the feathers off of the chicken. Um, but what about the nutrition? Uh, uh, here's comparing the nutrition of a grasshopper with um, a chicken. And you, this is for a 100 gram serving. And you can see that you can get three times more protein from insects than you can from the chicken. And in addition, you can. Um, Insects have a lot more of the micronutrients, the minerals, that are uh, part of a healthy diet, things like calcium, potassium, iron, um, and zinc. So insects are very healthy sources of protein. What about sustainability? Um, sustainability is, refers to how much resources are needed to produce um, the insects. So we're going to look at the water as the first resource. So this is how many grams of protein you can produce with 100 gallons of water. Now, I don't know about you, but I cannot visualize 100 gallons of anything. And I tried to think about how many gallons of milk in my refrigerator, and I gave up. So I did a little research. 
A bathtub, a standard bathtub is 47 gallons. 100 gallons then is two completely full bathtubs plus a whole bunch you slashed on the floor by mistake. Okay? So with 100 gallons of, uh, 100 gallons of uh, water, you can produce six grams of beef. Now, what is six grams? I mean, is it that much? Is it that much? Well, the key there that you see there, that's the key to my office. Um, I put it on the balance of my lab. It's 18 grams. So you can get, with two full bathtubs full of water, a third of a key's worth of protein from cattle. You can get double that from corn. You can get a whole key, key's worth from chicken. Um, 63 grams from um, soy. These are all main sources of protein. But you can get a lot more, 71 uh, grams from uh, crickets for the same amount of water. So insects use a lot less water um, than a lot of other protein crops. Another thing to look at is f uh, feed conversion. How much do you have to feed the animal in order to get protein uh, to get the protein. So if you take 22 pounds of feed, that's 10 kilograms, you can get two pounds of protein from, the, uh, from a cattle. That's a 9% conversion efficiency, two divided by 22. With the same amount of feed, you can get 20 pounds of protein from insects. That's a 90% conversion efficiency, 10 times more. Why are insects so uh, efficient at converting feed into protein? It's because, the, anybody know? It's because they're ectotherms, cold-blooded. They don't have to spend a lot of the energy they get from nutrients maintaining a body temperature like birds and mammals do. They can, di uh, they can allocate all of that to growth. So they're a lot more uh, efficient at converting the feed into protein. So to look at these two together, to get one kilogram of uh, protein from cattle, you need about 10 kilograms worth of feed and a fifth of that for uh, insects. For uh, cattle, you need 15,000 liters of water. That is a tanker truck. Literally, that is a tanker truck. To produce the same amount of protein from insects, it's five liters. That's that jug over there that you get at the supermarket. It's five liters. So insects um, use a lot fewer resources than do vertebrate livestock. Another thing that we look at in terms of uh, sustainability is greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases are things like uh, CO2, methane, and ammonia. The first two, CO2 and methane, are the main contributors to um, uh, climate change, to global warming. And if you uh, see here, to produce one kilogram of protein, you produce 300 grams of uh, greenhouse gases from chickens, 1,000 from pigs, and 2,850 grams of greenhouse gases, that's 2.8 kilograms of greenhouse gases from cattle versus one gram from insects. Insects barely produce greenhouse gases at all. So they're more environmentally friendly. What about land use? Well, this is, a, I love this map. This is, uh, was produced by Bloomberg News in 2016. It's all the land uses um, in the United States. I'm going to use a laser pointer on that screen over there. Here you can see all the land that's used for urban housing. This is rural housing. These are the suburbs. Urban commercial. Um, this is all the timberland in, um, in the United States. That's the area of all of our national parks. Um, well, you can't see it over there, but that little corner over there, that's all the railroads. Um, and if you look behind you over there, you can see uh, airports and so on. Of course, here's the golf courses. Um, don't want to forget those. 
This big brown thing in the middle, that's all the land that's used to grow cattle in the United States. It's all of this land here. Oops. Um, in addition, a lot of these cattle are grown on feedlots. So you need to feed them. So the, all the land that's needed to produce the food for the cattle is, oops, I'm pressing the wrong button. Um, is this area here. That is what's used to feed the cows over here that are not on pasture land. Um, now, to put that in perspective, all of the food that we eat, that we buy in the grocery store, cucumbers, tomatoes, avocados, apples, oranges, lettuce, and so on, that is grown on this land here which is half the land that's uh, used to produce food for the cattle. So 41% of all of the land in the United States and 70%, 70 percent, seven zero, of all the arable land in the United States, that's the land that, that can be used to grow stuff on, is devoted to the cattle industry. That's that area in red right there. Now, to put that in perspective, you can see those faint uh, white outlines there. Those are the outlines of the states in that area. I just had them colored in. 70% of arable land is 10 full states. You can see Colorado, Kansas, Nebraska, and so on, plus another bits and pieces of a 10 additional states. That is a lot of land. Now, when you're growing cattle, you can only grow cattle on a monolayer, right? They have to stand on the ground. Um, the same is for uh, pigs, the same is for uh, chickens for the most part. If you were to grow on a monolayer the exact same amount of protein but using insects, you would only need 7.5% of that uh, land, 7.5%, because insects require a lot less land. But it gets even better than that, because um, insects can be grown in what we call vertical um, farming. So every one of these trays has about 10,000 uh, mealworms in it. So, and you can stack these up as high as your ladder will go. And in fact, a lot of the industries um, use robots, because they can't get that high. Um, so if we were to look at the land use with vertical farming of insects, that blue square would be a lot, lot smaller. The, uh, the only reason it's that big, it actually would be so small that you can't see it. So I made it bigger just so you have something to look at. So um, using vertical farming with insects, um, is a very efficient use of land. And think about it, what that means is if you, you can free up all of this land then for something else. Now I want to change gears. And I want, to think about the, I want you to think about the paradigm we have in agriculture today. The paradigm is save the plants, kill the insects, because the insects eat the plants. Um, so a huge amount is invested on uh, pesticides, insecticides that are wrecking, wreaking havoc on the um, environment. So I want to turn this paradigm on its head, literally. One of the things that we're doing at the University of Arizona is we're finding ways to grow insects um, where the fruit is the insect and not the plant. All the plants you see here at the bottom, these are weeds that grow naturally um, around Tucson. They're also the host plants of these caterp... Oops, sorry. Um, the, the, um, the, the host plants of these caterpillars, the white line sphinx moth. These caterpillars are about that big. They're big, they're fat, they're juicy, and they're really good to eat. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop ways to grow the plants. And these are weeds. They don't have to be watered. 
They've been around here for thousands of years. They're adapted to the environment. They don't need a lot of maintenance. You don't want to use pesticides on them because you want the uh, insects to grow on them. Now, in the United States, 40% of all of the uh, food that is produced um, ends up in the landfill. 40%. Think of that. That's almost half your plate. Worldwide, it's 30%, and we can discuss afterwards why, what the discrepancy is there. That is about 31 million tons of food that gets thrown into the landfill. That is equivalent to $160 billion a year that gets thrown into the landfill. Um, I'm going to make the argument that you can use that to the, your advantage if you're using insects. So first off, um, a lot of the food that gets thrown into the landfill is too far gone. It's rotting, it's damaged, it's squished, it's uh, yucky, let's face it. Um, and instead of throwing it into the landfill, what you could do is you can make compost out of it, which is really good. You have big commercial entities that do that. And then you take that compost and you put them back on the plants. I'm going to make an argument for a different uh, thing to do. Take those rotting fruits and vegetables, turn it into compost, and then find an insect that will eat those, that compost. And then use that insects to produce protein. So you're using waste to produce protein. Now, finding insects that eat compost is ridiculously easy. Anybody who has a garden knows that there's grubs in the soil that are eating their uh, compost. These are called detritivores, and it's things like grubs, earthworms are detritivores um, that eat decaying organic material all over the world. Um, so if you find an insect that is, will happily eat the compost you made out of the um, food waste in your area, you can go directly from waste to protein. Now, um, some of the food that's grown, uh, sorry, that's th thrown out is perfectly good food. It's, for whatever reason, it doesn't make it into the uh, supply chain. It could be that it's ugly, like these carrots over here, and people don't want to buy them. Um, so they don't make it into the supply chain. Or it could be that they're just in excess. Anybody who has grown zucchini knows that when it comes time to harvest the zucchini, you can't give it away. Um, so there's a lot of excess food, but it's perfectly good food. So if you can take that perfectly good food and process it before it rots, that's a commodity right there. That is food. So um, what you see here in the figure, this is a, a prototype of a drying tower we've developed at the, uh, at the University of Arizona, where we take large quantities of um, excess fruits and vegetables, we dry it, and then we store it and use it whenever we need it. We use it to grow insects. You can feed it to the livestock. Or frankly, you can put it on the fields as fertilizer when you need it. In addition, um, 95 to 98% of all fruits and vegetables are water. So when we dry, the, uh, dry these things, we also reclaim that water. So every ton of fruits and vegetables that we process, we can reclaim a cubic yard's worth of water. That is a lot of water. Here, for example, is um, what we've done uh, again in my lab. We've taken leafy greens that were in excess. We drew, uh, dried them down in the sun, ground them up, fed them to the mealworms. And so from this excess leafy greens, we produced uh, protein for human consumption, these mealworms. So, all of this is nice. This is from my lab. All of this is nice. And you can grow as many pro uh, mealworms as you want. If you can't get people to eat it, it doesn't matter. 
Um, so how do we get people to eat this? I'm going to hand this over to uh, Chef Janos Wilder. So, Goggy, you had to show him the slides of the squirming worms. That's going to make my job a heck of a lot harder. So, we'll go back one. So, Goggy, you taught us a lot of stuff today, a really lot of really important stuff. We know, intellectually now, we know that insects are good for us. They're high in protein, high in the right fats, good source of minerals, good source of fiber. Importantly, we know that they're sustainable. They're good for the environment. They use less water. They use way less land. They're low on greenhouse gases. This is great stuff. That, that graphic that you showed, Goggy, of the difference between the land use for cattle and for insects was, was crazy. I, I, you guys must have th thought the same thing as me. You, you look at that and you see 70% of the arable land in the United States goes to cattle production, an infinitesimal amount, an amount that's so small that you had to cheat and expand it so we could actually see it, of the land use goes in to, in, to, into raising insects. But there's a problem. We don't really love insects. So I, I wonder, if you were offered these insects, would you eat them? Those look good to you? You're shaking your heads. <laughs> to me, I, I come from a different place than you do. I'm a chef. I think, oh, I, those look pretty good. You know, I can tell that they're crunchy, they're moist. The color of the photographs are really good. They look good? They look good to you? All right, you take some of those. I think we have something for you. But, so in fact, we know that there are a lot of people like you. When you go to a swanky party and you offer these insects and a glass of bubbly champagne and a cocktail concocted just for the occasion, well, you might be an early, an early adapter. And you're going to yeah. yeah. And you got the cocktail. Yeah. And you're going to summon up the saliva, and you're going to suppress the gag influence. And down the hatch, and you're going to say, oh my god, that's not so bad. Then you're going to say, oh, that's pretty good. And then you can say, ah, oh, I am so glad I tried this. I got to tell my buddies about this. And when you do that, see, the biggest problem is that we have to span the gap between what we know intellectually, that those squirming insects are really good for us, and that these insects are really good for us. We need to bridge that gap because most of you thought that looked terrible. <laughs> well, when we have some of those insects, we go a long way, you did, to build a bridge insect acceptance, and that's what we're looking to do. So how about these babies? So I wonder if you went to a restaurant like Noma in Copenhagen. Noma, for those of you who haven't heard of it, every year is considered either the top restaurant or one of the top five restaurants in the world. In Copenhagen, Copenhagen Noma takes a deep, deep dive in the local products, into foraging the local products, and their chefs are artists, and they create incredible food. Multi-course meals, super expensive. People make those reservations months in advance. They fly into Copenhagen for a meal. And we have research that shows that in an environment like that, where the insects are part of an experience, people are going to eat those insects. So you're going to have that as a course. I've already ate an insect before. I ate a grasshopper You're going to eat one tonight. In Colorado, fifth grade, after Awesome. Yeah, it's part of our curriculum. Well, in fact, you are. And it is a matter of survival. 
So you get it from Colorado, so it's not Yeah, you are supposed to. Wait, you're. All right. Yeah, you're making it look delicate. I wonder. If you were a Seattle Mariners baseball game, might you have some of those crickets that are in a cup? Yeah. They wanted the same thing in Seattle. In 2017, they were trying to figure out what are we going to put in the snack bars? You know, we want something that's going to be different. Everybody's got hot dogs and tacos and burgers and all of that. But what are we going to have that's a little different? Maybe they would make the news. That would be a good thing. Maybe people would actually order them. They came up with crickets. In 2017, the year that crickets went on the menu at the Seattle Mariners baseball games, they served 30,000 orders of crickets. They haven't looked back. So what do you think this is? Is it sand? Is it whole wheat flour? It's could be, actually, those squirmy little insects you saw at the beginning that you hated so much, cooked and made into insect flour. This insect flour is in the foods that you're eating right now. We call it insects by stealth. If you go to the grocery store, you'll find all sorts of items with insects in them. Oh, let's go back to that one. Okay, so from candies to croquettes, from pasta to pancakes, from bitters to burgers, you are already eating insects. It's really not by stealth. They're listed on the ingredients, but the point is they're already in the grocery store. So I wonder, you know, I'm really lousy at this. There we go, here we go. I wonder, if you could buy chips at the grocery store that tasted as good as Doritos or as good as Fritos and that insects in them and they were good for you and they were good for the environment, would you buy them? Yes. If you did, you're just bridging that, you're building that bridge to insect accept acceptance, to where we don't eat insects at all and to where we do. So look at this lobster. That is a beautiful lobster. That lobster is perfectly cooked. I can tell by the color of it that the, the, the tail meat is going to be just luscious. The claws are perfectly cooked. I bet you're wishing somebody you're wishing. Boy, that would be good for dinner tonight. But if we were in colonial times, you wouldn't think that at all. You would be revolted. In colonial times, lobsters were reviled. Lobsters were ground up and made into fertilize, fertilizers to put over the crops. Lobsters were used as bait for more lucrative catch. People didn't want to eat lobsters in their homes. They fed them to the prisoners. And the prisoners revolted. Now fast forward. Here we are. And at four-star restaurants around the world, lobster is often the most expensive item on the menus. At those restaurants, the lobsters are, are coddled and poached and sauced and anointed and prepared and presented so beautifully that you're just anticipating that first, that first bite. And when you have it, you think, oh my god, this is the best thing I've ever had in my life. Well, wait a minute, what changed? That's the same lobster that they were eating in colonial times. It doesn't taste any different. The lobster didn't change. We changed. Our culture changed. And we can change it again. Culture changes all the time. So how about these? Everybody recognizes this. Sushi, right? It wasn't so long ago, many of you don't remember this, but for many of you that you do, your mothers told you, don't eat that stuff. You can't eat raw fish. Raw fish is terrible for you. Nobody eats raw fish. Here, give that to me. I'm going to put it on the stove. We're going to cook the hell out of it. We're going to make it safe. And in 2000, 
2006, uh, 2010, the first sushi bars came to the United States. They were in little, in, in, in little Tokyo in Japan. 20 years later, they were all over. You could find them in every city. By two, in 2020, there, there are around the world, sushi bars are the most expensive restaurants in the world. Those little gems with 12 seats are the the highest price ticket that you can get. This food is absolutely prized, but it wasn't long ago at all that we wouldn't eat it at all and our mothers would forbid us to eat it. The food didn't change. That raw fish tastes exactly the same today as it did back then. We changed, our culture changed. So let's talk about culture for a second. In the United States, in Canada, in Western Europe, we're about the only areas in the world that don't eat insects. 80% of the world eats insects. And if you're lucky enough to go to Oaxaca, if you've been to Oaxaca, if you haven't been to Oaxaca, go to Oaxaca. And when you do, if you're in the Zocalo, that beautiful square in the center of the city where people promenade on the weekends and the bands play, it's absolutely gorgeous, take a little detour and go to the Mercado Benito Juarez. It's about a block away. It's a square city block, this market. They sell everything from textiles to more of the greatest variety of chilies I've ever seen in my life. Lots of beans, prepared food, and don't miss the ice cream. Best ice cream I've ever had in my life. They have more flavors than Baskin Robbins. But when you go into the market, they're gonna give you a little sample. They're gonna hand you, put in the palm of your hand, some fried grasshoppers. Don't miss it. Take a chance. Put them in your mouth, eat them. They're crunchy, they're salty, they're fried. It's like just great, the, the best fried food. Ask for more, that's what I did. Because that is important there, not only to them as a source of nutrition, but as they explain to me that they actually protect the crops there because the grasshoppers are a blight on the crops. So they protect the crops, they're good for you, they're good for the land. It's just another way, another example of how this works. How about these? These little pearls, escamoles, ant larvae, ant eggs. These are harvested in central Mexico from the maguey plant. They're considered a delicacy. If you happen to go to Mexico City and you go to the Zona Rosa and you're strolling down those beautiful tree-lined avenues past those great art galleries, those really swanky cool boutiques and the little restaurants, you go head into one of those restaurants, they're gonna be serving escamoles. They're gonna be on every table. So make sure you order them because they prepare them in such a simple and great way. They take these eggs and they saute them in butter with lime juice and salt and herbs and they and put them beautifully on the plate in front of you and they taste and you bite into them, the crunch and then the yolk from those little tiny eggs. It reminds you if you've, had, if you've been fortunate enough to have sturgeon from the Caspian Sea and heart where they harvest those eggs to make the best caviars in the world. This is as good as any caviar that you'll find from the Caspian Sea, these land eggs are as good as anything they sell at Petrosian in New York but they come from insects. They taste great, they're good for you. And when you have them, you're gonna bridge that, build that bridge to insect acceptance just a little bit farther. So it's not really about going to swanky cocktail parties. We don't all go to swanky cocktail parties where they serve insects. Some of you may be lucky enough to do that. It's really that People magazine and Glamour magazine write about these people. And you see them in magazines, and you see movie stars, and you see them eating little, little canopies of, of insects, and you think, I wanna, be at that, I wanna be at that cocktail party. If they can eat them, I can eat them. This is, this is what it's all about. It's really changing the culture. 
Sadly, very few of us are going to have a chance to go to Noma and Copenhagen. But we're going to read about Noma in the food magazines. We're going to see it in our social media. We're going to see it on TikTok. And we're going to wonder, what's all the big hubbub about insects? And when we get a chance, we may try them. And when we try them, it just comes a little bit to bridging that gap. So the big deal is when you go to the grocery store and you buy those chips, you buy any of those other products that are made from insects. That's the big deal. That's when it really changes. That's when, that's when we've really begun to build that bridge. So I want to do one more thing. Those guys back there, come on in. They're passing grasshopper tacos for you. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So I wonder if you're going to eat these grasshopper tacos. So the grasshoppers come from Oaxaca. The tortillas I brought with me, they're flour tortillas from Tucson. That's where we make flour tortillas, not corn tortillas. The beans from the Rio Sonora. And the salsa on there are made with chiltepines. <laughs> and the, the grasshoppers I sauteed just exactly the same way that they made those ant eggs in the Zona Rosa in Mexico City. So we've got plenty of those. Enjoy. Thank you all so very much. Yeah.